comes from um, and how to use it you know, during the day to hopefully make your sailing uh, a bit better and a bit faster. Um, uh, so what, what I'm going to do is just uh, put some slides and some uh, images up on the screen and we'll go, we'll go through these. Um, the first thing I guess is that uh, almost everybody who's been sailing for a little bit is a lot better at weather than they think they are because purely by the function of being rained on quite a lot over the years, you do pick up a lot of stuff. So, so I guess the most important weather instrument you have uh, is your is your Mark One eyeball, your observations. Um, your eyes are the obvious thing, but uh, also you, you can uh, you can get s s sensible information from. For example, noticeable changes in temperature. Has it suddenly gone a bit warmer? Has it suddenly gone a bit colder? That sort of thing. So those are those are very useful indicators of, of uh, the air changing, potentially the wind changing. Um, the photo I've got up on the screen now was taken uh, last summer uh, from one of our training periods uh, out in Emishima, which is the sailing venue for the Tokyo Olympics. <clears throat> Excuse me. And what you can see uh, just uh, in the background there is you can see individual layers, thin layers of cloud, which are quite coherent there. They're not, it's not, there's not, it's, it's not jumbling around. And, and, uh, and above that, you've got your normal cumulus, but this is definitely down on the surface. Everything's very, very, very flat and stable. Now on this day, we were expecting a sea breeze to make its way across the bay from the west. Um, and if you look down at the bottom of the picture there, you can just see um, a few boats bobbing around, really not doing very much at all. Um, but we could see this coming in from the west. That's the direction that this photo is looking at. So that told us that a bit of sea breeze was on the way, and lo and behold, a little bit later it did arrive. So my point is that um, uh, whatever the computer models say, um, I use those obviously, everyone does. I certainly do, they're great. But you have to, um, it's a really useful thing to use your mark on eyeball and your sailor's brain as well. So um, let's have a look at a few things. First of all, where can you get information from? Um, oh, loads of places these days. Um, this morning, uh, I'm having a cup of tea, uh, watching Aunt Carol on, uh, on, on the BBC at breakfast. Um, there are obviously other channels that do weather forecasts. Uh, and you can see that she was talking about a big high pressure system with the circulation going that way. So northwesterly and quite cloudy and rainy over Scotland and easterly um, down in Cornwall. I'm talking to you, by the way, from the weather shed at the bottom of my garden. Uh, on the east side of Falmouth Harbour in Cornwall, which is just down there. So there's that, there's, there's the telly. Um, uh, if, you're, if you're going sailing for a day, I strongly recommend you look at the synoptic chart. This is the one from this morning, well, it's technically from one o'clock this morning, and it shows that high uh, sentence to the west of Ireland with a ridge in, where, in which you'll have very little gradient wind going through the north of England there. So you're looking at northwesterlies in Scotland, easterlies, northeasterlies down the English Channel. You've got an old front coming across there, so cloudy, perhaps a little bit of rain potentially. And this funny thing here, which is we don't often see much actually, it's a, that's a convergence line. And that, what that means is that if you have air coming together, um, then often you'll have a, a line of squally clouds and potential rain there. So that's the overall situation. Um, if you if you an insomniac and you're listening to Radio 4, you've got the shipping forecast, which could come up and it's, also, it's, it's more useful than, the, than the people think these days, and a good thing to actually listen to every now and again. Now, for the UK, I normally look at the Met Office. Um, so this is the forecast for where I am, uh, uh, down at Justin Roseland, and this is the forecast this morning, um, and it told me that it should be nice and sunny for most of the day, just clouding over a bit uh, later on in the afternoon and overnight. Temperature-wise, not very much, nine degrees, which is nine degrees of a wind chill factor, taking it down to feeling like six. I'll go through this in more detail. Um, wind direction, east, northeast, uh, veering right and coming coming east. Not generally a pretty steady day, which is what you expect underneath a high pressure system. You've got more information if you want it. You've got satellite images. This is um, it's a little bit tricky to see, but there's Cornwall down there. There's the south coast of the UK, uh, Norfolk over there, Scotland over there. Um, that's that front that was loitering around and you've got um, cloud building up on either side of Cornwall there. You can also look at rain radar which is really handy. Um, this is almost in real time, there's about a 15 minute delay from the Met Office, so you can see there's rain down on the south coast, south side of the um, English Channel. Um, uh, and if you think back to the synoptic chart there was that uh, convergence line there which um, so that ties in quite nicely. It's always a really useful thing to do to Look at whatever a forecast tells you and then compare that to something that's actually an observation so it's not a computer model it's something that actually happens and 
<laughs> well, he should do. You should see the two of them uh, pretty much coinciding. Well, one would hope so. Anyway, um, what else can we get? You can get high resolution forecasts. This is from Predict Wind, the site which I, the, that I use quite a lot. There are loads of different types, but uh, anyway, um, and this gives two versions of the, uh, the of the weather um, for for where I am. I'm just there. Let's see just uh, for, for for the day. Um, there's that's Winguru, um, slightly slightly uh, lower resolution, but you know, generally gives reasonable information. Um, this is actual observations from a lovely site called Windicator. I'm going to go through these in a bit in slower time later on. I'm just really what I'm doing now is throwing out all this potential information. And then you've got uh, Windy, excellent site, um, gives you opportunity to look at lots of models and see what's going on. So. You know, broadly speaking, how do you deal with all this? You've got tons of info there, and um, you know, luckily, it's it's one one of one of my jobs is to sort through all this and make 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 relevant forecasts for people, which is great. But uh, if all you want to do is go sailing, you really haven't got either the time or the inclination to spend hours doing a forecast. Um, what's a good way to approach it? Well, I always say that if you're starting to do a forecast in the morning before you go to sea, or even if you are at sea. Um, just go outside with a cup of tea or coffee. Um, uh, go up on deck with a mug of tea or coffee um, and just have a look around, see see what's going on. Uh, this was at about half an hour, about 40 minutes after dawn this morning. Um, and a lovely morning, uh, absolutely clear as a bell, hardly any clouds at all. Um, what you can see, however, is uh, this is looking west, by the way. Uh, what you can see is this low layer here, which looks very dusty and murky. Um, that's exactly what it is. It is dusty. Uh, that's the inversion layer. Um, you often see that um, in the mornings, because if the, um, especially after a cold night, because the, the the surface temperature of the land is pretty cool. So so this, the the temperature of the air just above it is cool, which means it's very stable. It doesn't rise at all. So that will trap uh, in morning dust, things like that. Um, if you're out at sea, what you may see rather than a rather than the dust layer, because there isn't any dust, you may just see a, a, a low layer of where it's more moist, slightly uh, slightly, wor slightly hazier, basically. Um, so this tells me that it's a, it's a pretty, it's, it's, it's in, the, in the morning anyway, it's pretty stable. Um, there's, and there's not an awful lot of change going on there. So once you've had a look, once you've had your mug of tea and you've woken up, um, have a look at the big picture. So this was the, what I've got on the left here. This is a uh, synoptic chart from midday today, well, midday uh, UTC, so 1300 British summer time. Um, and you can see the, the high pressure system is there to the west of Ireland. There's this almost stationary dissolving front uh, stretching down over the north of England, potentially the very south of Scotland. Um, and still there's that convergence line on the southern side of the channel there. So if we look over at the satellite image, um, you've got more cloud uh, over North Scotland there. That's the remnant of that front just dribbling down through there. Um, uh, and uh, coming down coming down the channel, you've got this line here, this cluster, clustering of um, uh, cumulus clouds, slightly deeper clouds. Uh, and again, coming down, coming down the, the south coast of England there, you've got little lines of, of cumulus, little lines of small cumulus. Mm -hmm. Uh, just just popping up off things like Portland Bill and the various headlands going down. So all this ties in uh, the this satellite image here, which is an observation. It's what's actually happening. Ties in with the synoptic chart there, which is partial observations, yes, but also um, uh, generated by the uh, computer model. So this 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 sets our scene. So if if we look at where I am here, down in Cornwall, um, I'd be expecting to have a moderate. Uh, occasionally gusty easterly wind. That's what uh, the forecast is telling me. Let's have a look at how much um, observation detail we can get here. What can we what can we see? So this is that Windicator site that I mentioned earlier. Um, and this has uh, links to um, all the, uh, well, not all of them, but to a good selection of weather stations uh, around the country. Uh, and this was, I, I, I got this screen grab about, um, about an hour ago. So, so it's, it's it's pretty pretty recent, and you can see that as we expect, you've got northwesterlies or westerlies over Scotland. There's really not much wind in the middle of the country there through the Midlands because uh, that's where the ridge of the high pressure system is, and then it's pretty strong coming down the channel there, but from mostly from the east. So that's that's all looking alright. Um, I'm also looking here at rain radar. Uh, this is from the Met Office. It gets updated every five minutes or so. Uh, with normally about a maybe a 10 minute lag. So it's, it's pretty recent. 
and you can see that uh, there was rain there this morning from where that convergence line was, but it's gone now. Uh, but we do have rain up in Scotland, so up there it'll be pretty chilly. You'll have a you'll have a, a northerly, uh, sorry, a northwesterly breeze with occasional uh, occasional showers coming through. So it'll be pretty cold um, up there in Scotland. And this this observational uh, detail just helps confirm really in your mind that that what the forecast is saying uh, actually makes sense, um, uh, which is always a good thing. So the next thing to do is look for a detailed forecast. Um, in the UK, my my first stop would always be the Met Office. Um, their, their their website and app is a bit clunky, but the data is great, and that's 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 what you should really be after. Um, uh, so, so, so this is the this is the forecast from this morning. It all looks pretty pretty steady. East northeast at least till about noon, um, and then east these after that until uh, coming up to dusk. So that's pretty much what has happened so far, which is uh, which is nice. Um, the uh, the cloud the the cloud or lack of it means that um, it's going to get a little bit warmer during the afternoon. And you can see that it goes from it's, it's not exactly tropical. I mean, I am wearing shorts, but but I always wear shorts. Um, uh, but so your, your temperature will get up to about the, the surface temperature will get up to about nine degrees. Now the actual surface temperature will probably be a couple of degrees more than that. Um, this is, these are air temperatures that's, that are being given there. So what you'll probably find is that um, is that uh, the the land the surface will get um, will get will get warmer, um, and you'll probably find there's more cumulus cloud as stuff bubbles up, and that's exactly what's happening. Also, if you were sailing in this and, you, and it was an offshore breeze, if you were downwind of, of, of a land in a bay or something like that, you'd find that the, um, uh, the stability of the atmosphere, the mixing would get, vertical mixing would be more. So you'd have more of a gust to lull ratio uh, and more of a side to side short phase shift pattern. But we'll see, talk about that more in a little bit. Um, also, it's a good idea to look at wind maps, wind charts. They give you a really nice idea of the of the flow of the wind. The only problem is um, that not so, it's not a problem. The only uh, uh, thing you have to be aware of is is what high resolution actually means. Um, uh, so 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 does your high resolution forecast take into account every fiddly bit of land or not? And the quick answer to that is no. Uh, and so this is why. Um, once you've got your forecast, you then have to use your sailor's brain to um, uh, uh, to think about what's actually going to happen during the day. And this is what we're going to come to now. So, uh, first of all, we'll have a look at um, the model resolution of uh, of various forecasts that you get around the world uh, or from around the world. Um, all weather forecasts these days depend on numerical weather pro uh, programs, which basically divide the Earth's surface and the atmosphere and the ocean beneath the sea surface. Uh, into a three-dimensional grid with basically, if you can think of it like a wire mesh, and every time there's a corner, that's where the that's where the program calculates things like wind or pressure or humidity, or that sort of stuff. So a, a common source of weather data um, is a computer program called the, the computer, computer model called the, the Global Forecast System, which is put up by the, the US version of the Met Office. They're, the uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which really trips off the tongue, NOAA. Um, and their, their model, which they put out uh, four times a day for free, um, uh, you can get a quarter degree resolution. And this is what a quarter of a degree looks like. It's 15 nautical miles north to south. Uh, and depending, obviously, how far north or how far away from the equator are you, you are less than that east to west. So where I am down here, and I am just there, um, that's what a quarter of a degree resolution looks like, which, which is fine if you're in the middle of the ocean, um, because not really much happens. But if, if if you're doing an event, say in Falmouth Bay there, and you want to get a, res a weather forecast, you you can plug onto many weather or weather sites, and they'll give you the averaged weather forecast for the the closest four grid points there. And as you can see, you know the wind, the fork of the wind, the actual wind there in the middle. A little bit out to sea is going to be very different from the wind inland there or the wind on the north shore there. So you've got to be a little bit careful with understanding uh, what your resolution is and where you're looking at, where you're using it. If you're using quarter degree data in the middle of the ocean, that's plenty. In fact, it's actually probably more than enough. You can get away with half degree because there's nothing in the middle of the ocean to really get in the way of the wind flow. But around land, 
it's it's not that great for for thinking about detailed stuff. So let's have a look at another one. Um, the European Centre for Medium Medium Range Weather Forecasting, the ECMWF, which is based in Reading, does an excellent forecast. Um, uh, and their resolution globally is nine kilometres. So we're getting a little bit more detail now, which is great. Um, the Met Office around the UK does a 1.5 kilometre grid around the UK, which is much better. And uh, again, this is where this is where I am now. I'm I'm talking to you from a shed just there. Um, uh, and uh, that's what that's what the 1.5 kilometer um, model looks like over Carrick Roads, over the harbour here. Uh, so basically, at every single one of those points, and vertically up in the atmosphere, um, and also down below surface, um, if it's above sea, uh, all the various physical parameters are calculated. So you know, this is all great, and uh, you know, I get very excited about this because it's my job to get very excited about this. But but why do we care? Why do we care? We care because the resolution of the model affects very much what can be forecast and what can't. Um, uh, you may you may remember this back in two thousand and four, uh, the village of Boscastle on the north shore of Cornwall got completely flooded. Um, uh, luckily, uh, no one was killed, and no one was actually even. Um, uh, badly injured, obviously a few scrapes and bruises, but nothing, nothing serious. A lot of, a lot of material damage there. Very expensive for the village and for the cleanup. Um, and what I've got here is, is, uh, is, is some some rain forecast. Actually, let me just go back. Oh, the, the, the 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 Met Office for that day. This is back. This is, remember, this is sixteen years ago now. Uh, well, fifteen and a half years ago now. Um, and the Met Office model back then had a 12 kilometer spacing around the UK. So, so much coarser than it is now. And in fact, for, for, the, for that afternoon, um, they had forecast light showers. Uh, and you, can, you can laugh about it because no one was hurt, but um, there was a, an owner of a bed and breakfast whose his major job that he had put on his to-do list that day was to, to, to install a water feature in this front garden that she got with spades. Um, anyway, uh, if, we, if we look at the actual rainfall for that day, the, on the left hand side of the screen there, um, now let's just uh, show you the, uh, the, the, you can see the black line is the shape of Cornwall. So that's the coastline there, um, right there. The, um, uh, the circle there circles Boscastle itself. So what's all happening is in the middle of there. Now the left hand one, that's the actual, uh, that's the forecast for that day that was issued. So you can see a little bit of rain, so maybe slightly heavier showers along there. All the way over on the right hand side over here, that's what actually happened. That's the rainfall radar for that day. And basically what happened is we did have one of those little convergence lines, uh, which um, I mentioned before on today's synoptic chart, but it happened over the land there. So effectively you had all this, um, all this cloud building up and just chucking down the rain the whole time on the same spot. And it lasted there for a period of several hours, which caused, caused the flooding. Now the, uh, the panel in the middle is because the Met Office obviously uh, were concerned about this, and a few a few years later, uh, well, not that not, not that much further out, they brought out a, a four kilometer resolution model, um, and uh, they, they they ran they ran their four kilometer resolution model with all the original data that they used uh, back here, and this is the result. So you can see this is the forecast data using a four kilometer model. This is a forecast, and that's actually what happened. That is a whole lot more representative than that. This would trigger flood warnings. That is someone put, you know, someone still wanting to put a um, a water feature in their garden. So that's the difference that, that model resolution can make. Um, why do we care about it as sailors? Well, we care about that because it affects the things that we have to think about when we're looking at uh, the venues that we're sailing at. What I've got here is I'm just representing, for all of you who are going into shock, by the way, I'm not going to be talking about signs and cosines. This is just um, a, uh, I'm not going back to physics. Um, I'm just going to, uh, uh, what I'm doing here, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just showing this, this, this wave, this feature here, there's something that you want to model. Maybe it's, um, it's the way that the atmospheric pressure is, is higher there or lower there or higher there or lower there. Maybe it's, um, it's, it's a valley that you want to, that you want to model so that your land, so the land model um, that you use to, to calculate your wind is correct. Whatever it is, it doesn't really matter. Let's say that your that your that your model resolution is half the size of the feature. Okay, so if this was a valley, 
then then your your model resolution is half the width of the value. So let's say if we had do that, and we take it, we'll take a sample there, a sample there, a sample there, and a sample there, and if we join those all together, then that looks fairly fairly okay. You know, and we've got it's a bit crude, but we've certainly got the peaks, and we 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 have the uh, the troughs in, the, in between the two there. So you think, okay, great. Um, however, if you just move this thing a little bit like that, and do the same thing, so the same feature, but with just the grid moved a little bit. Then you miss it completely. Okay, so if your if your grid size is half the feature, uh, half the size of whatever you're trying to model, um, then then you may well miss it. If you make it half again, so you make your grid your grid size a quarter of the size of the thing you're going to model, then you can start to get some um, some safety in there. Because if you do it like that, great, it works. If you do it like if you move it a little bit and you do it like that, great, that also works. It's a bit crude, but it works. So what this means is that. In general, the smallest feature that you can model um, uh, with a computer program is about four times the size of the grid. And if you think about um, uh, weather forecasts, sometimes they'll have, you know, with the Met Office, for example, they'll have a 1.5 kilometer model. So the smallest thing that the Met Office can forecast is six kilometers wide. And that's a really big cloud. So you, you haven't got anything that will forecast down to individual score size yet. Um, even the the highest resolution uh, commercial models that you've got, the one kilometer stuff that you can you can buy, which which does that by by doing extra processing with in theory a a better land model, still one kilometer times four is still four kilometers wide, and I think this 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 is shown in what I think is the the best example that I've seen anyway for this. Back in Rio uh, for the 2016 Olympics, um, this is the land mask or the land model used by one of the big commercial companies and i I, I, I use this forecast every day i like to so I'm, I'm not having a go at forecasts here uh because they're great but you need to understand the um uh their weaknesses and their strengths i used to use this forecast every day uh because it was good for timings but let's have a look at the physical characteristics about it because this is the model that they use this is the land model that they use to develop their wind data um and as you can see, the, the dark brown stuff is high. So you can see the large rectangular box of mountains, which effectively go all the way around um, Rio. Uh, that's Guanabara Bay, the main, the, main, um, the main harbor. And if we zoom in a bit more, the sailing took place around there and outside there. And if we look at the, um, uh, the yellow circle is the medal race course. So if we if we look at the land around here, that 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 high bit there, that's where Christ the Redeemer, the big statue, is. And if if you if if you look at it, this this spit of land here looks like a very low um, a low spit of land. Uh, bear in mind that most of the wind came uh, onshore, so it was either a sea breeze or an onshore gradient wind of some sort. So 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 this was generally at the windward end of the metal race course. Now in real life, we have that. At the windward end of the metal race course, and this is the single most significant physical feature in the harbour. There, Sugarloaf itself, it's about 400 odd metres high, a couple hundred metres wide at the base. But the thing is, you can fit several of these into a one-kilometre box. So the fact that the model didn't even acknowledge its existence is not a criticism of the model. It's something that you have to understand when you're interpreting high-resolution model data. Um, I think I've probably ranted on enough about that now, so we'll, we'll move on a little. Um, so we've got our overall forecast now. Uh, so what about you know the thing about what about sub grid stuff? What do I mean by that? Um, I mean the uh, the features that a high resolution forecast can't do because it's not high resolution enough. Um, let's have a look at that. Let's have a look at that with respect to Carrick Roads that I'm looking out over now. Um, so with today's forecast for a wind coming. Pretty much from there, um, the what the forecast won't do. If you look down here, you can just see there's a the, 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 that's St Anthony Head there, which is quite high. Um, there'll be a mass of lee underneath there. There'll be lots of swirly stuff. Similar thing will happen uh, along here. In there, there's be a mass of lee there because it's quite a it's a relatively tall ridge which drops off pretty quickly. So so so, so there'll be a, a fairly big gap before the before the wind makes it down to the surface on that side, which isn't forecast, which won't really be picked up by the uh, by the high resolution forecast because it's too small a feature. On the other side, 
um, as the wind does make it down to the to the uh, uh, surface, and it'll 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 be funneled a little bit um, into the inner harbour there. So you'd expect more wind and possibly a little bit of a bend um, going around that headland there. Now, as sailors, you'd look at that and you think, yeah, there's bound to be a bit of an acceleration around that headland, but the um, the numerical weather programs don't get that because it's too small a detail for them. It's just not big enough to be picked up. So this is this is what I mean by subgrid grid forecasting. And this is something which only you can do when you look at the when you look at the for, the forecast. You think, okay, the wind's coming from the east or whatever it is. Where is it coming over? Where is it going to go round? What does it have to go over or through to get to me? And that can be a really powerful tool to um, help you work out where's going to be good on the race course and where's not going to be good on the race course. Um, another example of that, uh, uh, a year or two ago, um, Storm Doris, uh, really quite, quite, quite blustering. This is this is the aftermath where it was uh, it was blowing low twenties in um, Portland Harbour, or, uh, where the British sailing team is based and does a lot of its training. But going around the bottom of Portland Bill, there it was on average about forty-one knots and uh, gusting up to fifty-eight. Which is really quite breezy. Um, now, for those of you who've not been to Portland Bill, it's an enormous chunk of rock, um, uh, which is too big for the wind to easily go over. So it, a lot of it has to go around. And as it goes around the edges, you get a lot of acceleration just around the edges. I'm sure if we had a, a, a weather station there, that would have read almost nothing because it's right in the lee of the bill there. Um, other, other, uh, other effects which aren't often picked up are. Um, the effect of the, uh, not necessarily, this is now not an effect, uh, not a physical effect by um, things sticking up into the into the air, but this is more of an effect of the diff change in, in the surface heating profile, how, how that affects things. So um, with thermal enhancement, what you'll get, if you have an onshore wind, in this case, we're looking at the, the coastline uh, in between Selsey Bill and Brighton over there. Um, if you have a southwesterly, which you do quite often, that's the wind. My white line there is just my uh, my my nominal isobar, because uh, generally what happens is that uh, if you look at a synoptic chart, your wind direction you can work it out by putting an arrow going across the isobar, as you see there, um, at an angle of 15 degrees over water, going from the high pressure side to the low pressure side. Um, and in the northern hemisphere, um, if you're standing your back to the wind, low pressure system, the low pressure side is on your left, the high pressure side is on your right. So if we have this in the morning before the land is warmed up, then that's all great, that's all lovely. But as the land warms up, the, the pressure over the, the, the surface pressure over the land will actually drop. So as the, winter, as the land warms up, as it gets to noon and in the early afternoon, the pressure of the land will actually decrease a bit because the air has been heated up and so it expands and you have air going up to sea and going everywhere else. So you physically have less air over the land. Whereas the sea temperature doesn't change as much. So, so that stays pretty much the same. So for a start, if you have a high pressure there and a lower pressure there, that means you have more of a pressure difference. So your wind is going to increase a bit. Also, the isobar will bend. Um, uh, effectively, effectively, it'll bend to the right like that. Uh, because if it was a thousand millibars there and things have got a bit lower, uh, generally to the left, then, um, then, then that, that thousand millibar line will be pushed further that way. So what this does is that means the wind veers to the right, it bends to the right as well, just on the inshore bit there. So this is called thermal enhancement. And uh, often it's a fairly sudden effect, right, which you get often at about between two and 2.30 local time in the afternoon, two or three o'clock local time in the afternoon. Um, and what you'll see is you'll see uh, a wind increase, wind speed increase of three or four knots, um, and, uh, and it'll shift to the right by about maybe 15 or 20 degrees. And that'll take place over a, quite a short period of time, maybe 20 or 30 minutes. I mean, that's purely a local effect due to the land heating up more than the sea. Um, with the, if you have the wind coming uh, still onshore, but from the other way, um, you have a, uh, a phenomenon which um, uh, I've, I've, I've blatantly nicked this from the, um, uh, from from Hugh Styles, uh, and he called it thermal disenchantment. And I think it's a great it's a great name. So that's that's what I'm using. Um, similar sort of thing. If you have a um, same same the same coastline, but onshore wind, but from the other side now, uh, so southeasterly or east southeasterly. Um, if that's your isobar again, then 
Again, we think of in the Northern Hemisphere, stick your left arm out with the back behind you, or sorry, with the wind behind your back, um, and the low is off to the, uh, your left, so in this case, off to sea, and the high pressure in this case is um, over land. So in the, what, what happens during the day, just as before, the land heats up, which causes the air to expand, which means there's less surface pressure on land. So that pressure becomes not so high. And again, that bends the isobars to the right, which means that your wind, when you have your th this thermal disenchantment effect, will still go to the right, but it will become more patchy and less strong. So these are just examples of, fa of, of, of effects which generally aren't picked up very well by, um, uh, uh, by numerical um, weather models, good as they are for, you know, for loads of stuff. And don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm not just saying, them saying we should all go back to, to rocks on, on, on a string and put the seaweed out the back, um, useful as they are. But, uh, but, but the, you have to understand what they're, what they're good at and, and what their, their design limits, as it were, are. So let's go now and have a look at how, uh, once you've got your forecast, how, how does it change on contact with reality um, and, um, and how can you how can you uh, keep track of things during the day um, without having to look at forecasts all the time you know while you're still just just sailing having fun racing hard um, how can you keep track of things how can you keep track of the forecast well well I'm going to use the example of a um, uh, of a low pressure system coming across because that's what we get a lot of uh, in the UK and in uh, northern Europe in general so uh, generally with forecasts, the, the what of the forecast tends to happen. Um, uh, it's the, it's the, the timing of it that, that, is often, that is often changing. So in other words, if a front's supposed to come through, if it's forecast initially to come through at half past two, it may come through a little bit earlier, it may come through a little bit later. So when you get your forecast in the morning, if you, you think, right, front's going to be here at three o'clock, uh, so I'm expecting the wind to veer to the right behind the front. So right, great. I'm going to uh, I'm going to make sure that about um, uh, at about ten to three, that I'm, I'm I'm on the right hand side of the course, and I'm 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 just you know protecting myself over there because I know the wind's going to go to the right at three o'clock. That would be an entirely optimistic and not very sensible way of doing it. The the best way to I think anyway to 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 look at a forecast is to try and understand what you'll see with that forecast and how it will uh, affect the conditions for you. Because that way, if you're expecting a certain uh, 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 procession of, of, of conditions to come through, as they come through, you'll be able to tell whether they're coming through a bit sooner or a bit, a bit slower than you, you thought. So for example, with this, with our, um, our low pressure system here, if you're ahead of it to start with, and this warm front is forecast for a few hours down the track, then to start with, you'll be in relatively cold, relatively dry air. Um, and you'll see uh, above you, you'll start to see, first of all, high wispy clouds, the cirrus clouds, and then over the next few hours, they'll come, they'll be coming in slightly lower, slightly thicker, slightly darker. They'll probably be coming in from a direction to the right of where your surface wind is, and quite a long way to the right of where your surface wind is, uh, maybe 30, 40 uh, degrees to the right of where your surface wind is. Because they'll, they'll they'll be driven in by by the the flow behind your front, which should in general be a little bit further to the right. Um, and basically, once you start to see lower cloud coming towards you with obvious rain underneath it, that's when the front's coming, and that's when you should start to do whatever you thought was um, necessary because of the change in the weather. Um, so you should try and uh, you should use the forecast. Um, I think you should use the forecast to work out what's going to happen during the day, what you're going to see. Um, and use that to and use that physical progression of things as it actually happens to um, to affect your tactics or how you how you run your day in the water. Once the uh, once the front's gone through um, and you're into the warm sector, the warmer, wetter air in between the, the, the warm front and the cold front, things tend to be a bit steadier. Uh, it, it'll probably be cloudy, maybe some sunny patches. You might have the occasional shower, uh, but generally things are fairly steady in the warm sector. Um, the next the next big change coming through, of course, is the is the cold front itself. Which, if that's forecast to come through while you're out sailing, what you should expect is a, um, a reasonably obvious line of squall clouds, much darker, bigger, with rain underneath them. Um, so as that comes along, then you need to prepare for uh, for, for 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 the individual squall cloud um, uh, effects, which we'll look at in a little while. 
Um, but then afterwards, that's when the wind should go further to the right and things will get a lot, a lot brighter and, and drier. It may still be blowing, blowing old boots, um, but it should be a lot more pleasant after that. So I guess what the point is, try and understand what the forecast is giving you in terms of things you'll see or feel. Um, by and by feel, um, uh, with the with the cold front, uh, with cold front for example, um, if your stratus cloud in the warm sector is very thick, you may not actually be able to see through it to to see to see the bit of larger clouds behind it. But generally, ahead of the cold front, you tend to get gusts of colder, cooler air coming down off the off the clouds. Admittedly, you don't have an awful lot of time to deal with things like that. But things like that, uh, temperature differences are uh, noticeable. Temperature differences are often as much of a clue. Um, as, a, as, as, a wind, as a wind shift or as a cloud. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's on a quite a big scale, uh, sort of a weather system scale. Uh, it also, it also um, looking at changes uh, is also important on a smaller scale. This photo here was taken um, in Hiers uh, on the south coast of France uh, a, couple of, a couple of years ago. Um, and about 20 minutes before this was taken, um, there was a, a banner cloud um, just sort of coming off the off that hill there. What we what we had when that cloud was there, and, and that cloud had been had been sat there all morning. Um, uh, and we had, we had a slightly onshore breeze there, a southwesterly onshore breeze, which meant that it was bringing um, uh, warmer, wetter air uh, onto the uh, uh, onto the land, and that that air then went up, was pushed up that hill. Um, the air cooled down. Which meant that the um, the 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 moisture in it condensed, so you formed that cloud, and that pretty much stayed there um, while that wind was there. Uh, when when it when when that cloud disappeared, that was a sign that something had changed on that hill. And what happened there was that the wind shift to the right, which was expected, um, had come in, and because it went, it, it turned it, because the wind shift turned it from a an onshore breeze, a moist onshore breeze, to a drier offshore breeze. There was no longer moisture there to form that cloud. So, um, so the cloud disappeared. And about 15, 20 minutes later, we had a wind shift out on the water. So just keep an eye open for that. If you've got a, if you've got a cloud that's, that, that's, um, uh, that, that's based over a bit of land, an orographic cloud, uh, something which is, which is formed by, by air, by moist air hitting land, rising up and forming your cloud. If that disappears, then you've had a wind shift uh, because you now have drier air hitting that same land mass. Um, so things like that are really useful um, and can can uh, can give you good information in advance about what's actually going to happen because something something something's happened to change things visually upwind. Um, on top of that, we can uh, we, we we know we've looked at how the uh, we've spoken about wind direction changes and wind speed changes and things like that. Also, what about the nature of the wind? Uh, is, it, is it puffy and shifty, or are there pressure bands, or or whatever? Um, and the actual nature of the clouds can give you some good clues for this. The the picture on the left here is, is fairly obviously a satellite image, um, and the the sort of honeycomb shape of clouds are to the west side of that image is very typical of open ocean cumulus clouds. Um, cumulus clouds are the 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 the, the higher, deeper prefer. Uh, Mr. Man clouds, um, and and what a cloud is, what a cloud is, it's a collection of water droplets, which is which is held up there by air going upwards. Um, and so if you if you see a cloud, that's that's because there's a bunch of bunch of water droplets up there held up there by a by an updraft. They're not normally you know, it's not very really strong updrafts, but because the water droplets aren't very big. But they the, that, that's that's the mechanism. So if you have air going up, then at some stage you can have air coming down as well. So the shape of the clouds. Gives you a good indication of, of of the of the gust and shift pattern on the water. So if you've got lots of little puffy cumulus clouds, then you're going to have lots of little gusty puffs um, uh, on the water. The the picture on the right took out the window um, uh, just before landing at Palmer uh, um, last year. Actually, um, I am the world's most interesting person to sit next to on an aircraft. I uh, really, honestly, anyway, um, and. Uh, the when we landed, the, the we saw, uh, this cloud from the bottom looked pretty pretty uniform. Yeah, there was this grey stratus with a couple of bright patches, but nothing nothing serious. Um, uh, but what you can see above this is um, uh, that the the cloud itself is not uniform at all. Um, you have uh, you have sort of long long lines of cloud there, and that gives you an indication that that the the air going up is 
is is is is is, is not so uniform because these big lumps of cloud are being are being held up there by something. And so if you have all this stuff happening in long lines up there, then it's a better indication that you're probably going to have um, uh, uh, bands of pressure. So that's why underneath stratus clouds, often you'll get you uh, it won't be anywhere near as unstable as as with cumulus clouds, but you'll still have bands or large patches of pressure there. Um, this is an example, this photo here, that was uh, a couple of years ago, just walking the dogs around here. Um, and uh, you can see again, it's, it's, it, there's quite a lot of cloud there, more long clouds as opposed to little puffy ones. So again, more um, longer, larger patches of, uh, of, of, of pressure on the water. Here's an example from, um, <laughs> sorry, you can hear my G4 cars the barking at me outside. Um, that's Molly the Spaniel. Um, what we have out here, on this slide here is, uh, this was at the sale for Gold Regatta back in 2015, summer 2015 uh, in Weymouth. Um, and we had uh, an offshore northeasterly. So uh, in the morning, you can see lots of little patches of cloud there. Uh, and in the afternoon, similar sort of thing. Uh, it's still patches of cumulus cloud, but there's more of them and they're slightly deeper. Um, the it was quite a cold day, so that it wasn't it wasn't warm enough to actually turn into a sea breeze. But what what happened was that the the land heated up anyway, which is not quite enough to to form a sea breeze. And you can see that in the changing nature of the wind. The wind trace that I've got here was wind trace was this wind wind information that we had um, that we took uh, on the water. Uh, the the red curve is wind direction, um, and each of the each of the uh, graduations there is ten degrees. So if you look along in the morning, so the, start, the recording starts at 11 o'clock, you've got a little short phase shift there, but in general, it's fairly steady. Bit of a blob there, I think that was someone going to the moon. Um, but then round about midday, it starts to get, there's much bigger oscillation going on, and the short phase shift pattern is actually wider there. Same thing with the, if you look at the, the wind speed as well, it's um, in the morning there, while things are still quite cool, um, there's not that much of a gust to lull. In this case, Every um every every vertical line is two knots, but then as soon as it starts to get warmed up in the uh, in the afternoon, a couple of things happen. First of all, your gust to lull gets more. It's now getting up to six to eight knots with the gust to lull, and also the whole thing starts to get a little bit less strong because it's trying to form a sea breeze hold, but it can't, so it's very unstable. Um, and that's uh, and the, the 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 pattern on the water was much like that as as shown by here. So. That's where we are with that. The, um, uh, let's have a look now at how uh, an individual cloud can potentially uh, change the wind around it. So this is looking at it from above. Uh, and in this case, the wind is coming from the top of the page down to the bottom, because um, that's where wind has to go, apparently. Um, so the cloud's coming down with it like that. Um, if you think of the downdrafts from the cloud, so your cloud's sitting on on an updraft going out like that. And, and, and as the air gets to the top, it's cooled down and it falls back down to the um, to the ground or so to the um, surface underneath it like that. And you can you can think of it going out from the base of the clouds in all directions. So the red arrows there are the downdrafts as they hit the surface and go out. That's the gradient wind. That's, that's the wind that you'd have without the cloud there. So if one of these things, if you're upwind of one of these, then your, your local wind at the surface is going to be much the same direction, but just less. If you're downwind of it, your, um, your, your, wind down, uh, your wind on the surface is going to be much the same direction, but more because you've got the downdraft added on to the, uh, to, to the normal wind there. And the interesting thing is what happens if the clouds coming down your side. Basically, you don't get that much of a wind speed increase. You get a little, but not much. But we have a much more significant... Um, uh, uh, wind direction increase and basically it pushes the wind away from the cloud. So let's have a look at how this this affects you potentially going upwind or downwind. So if we're going, if you're going upwind and you see that um, the cloud is going to go in front of you, it's going to go basically down the leeward side. Then as you get close to it, you're going to get headed as the wind starts to go away from the boy like that. So you can tack across and take the lift on the other tack before coming back. If the cloud is going to go directly over you or behind you, in other words, if it's going down your windward side, then you're going to have to suck up the um, uh, the uh, the increased wind speed. But you should get a, you should be able to get a lift on that tack and then sail out of that uh, back in the wind on the other side there like that. Um, 
with it going downward, again, it depends whether you're whether it's on your leeward or your windward side. As the um, as the cloud approaches, if it's on your windward side, then you'll actually get a bit of lift downwind. You'll be pushed closer to where you want you want to be going. You pushed further downwind. If it comes down your leeward side, then you're going to be uh, uh, you're going to be effectively headed downwind like that. And then once it's gone past, you'll be back to where you were before. So the the the, the clouds have a more of effect, more of an effect on wind direction than on wind strength when they're coming down off your side. And that can potentially be quite useful if you want to go a bit further that way or a bit further that way. Um, right, so that's pretty much where we are uh, for now. Um, I guess I guess to summarise everything then, um, look out the window. It's a really good thing to do for a weather forecast. Uh, apart from anything else, it may be well be the last five minutes of peace you get during the day. But um, it's really worthwhile at the beginning of a sailing day, just going outside and spending five or ten minutes just looking around, having a look, see what's going on, see which direction the clouds are coming from, uh, and just thinking in general about what's going on. Understand the big picture. In other words, use the, um, the synoptic charts and the satellite images. Try and use multiple sources if you can. Uh, there's oodles of, of, um, of weather information out there. Um, try and get uh, sources that you use regularly and that you trust. So that um, so that you can get uh, into a, into a good rhythm with using you know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel each time. Whatever website you use, um, before you start using it for actual forecasts, have a dig around to make sure you understand where they get their data from, where the source data is. Is it is it slightly delayed or not? Because um, that can be the problem with with, with some of the commercial websites. Um, they they use data, source data which is a little, maybe twelve hours out of date, which which doesn't do you much good really. So. Um, so, 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 so do make sure you understand where it comes from. Once you've got your forecast, uh, think subgrid. Uh, how is this wind going to flow over, around, or through physical obstacles? How is the temperature changing of the surface going to going to affect the nature of the wind? Um, am I going to get any visual clue from that? Um, what's coming in? Uh, how can that? How, how can I? How can I work out things to watch for just to let me know that the forecast is coming on? And I guess most importantly, when you're looking at clouds, if it looks like an elephant, um, turn left. Really important that. Anyway, um, do please come back with any questions or, or comments you have. Um, come through the, the, the British Sailing Team's um, social media feeds. Uh, use the hashtag sail from home. Um, thank you very much for listening. And remember, stay at home, protect the NHS and save lives. Thanks very much.